research education. I'd like to thank everybody for being here. Um, you know, I'm one of those kind of people that some of my best ideas, I think, happen kind of tangentially in conversation or just random experiences. So uh, if I tend to go off, what have please, y'all bear with me for one second. Uh, very happy for everybody to be here. Uh, my name is James R. Morgan III. Uh, my presentation, as you can see, is entitled Prince Hall Freemasons, Agents of Agitation and Abolition. Uh, I'm going to start off with one of my, one of my stories. Uh, I actually had the pleasure of uh, working with uh, our, one of our presenters, Dr. Collins, um, with digitizing some of the old Alabama uh, Prince Hall Masonic records a few months ago. And as I was going through it, you know, I found a lot of famous people and a lot of different guys, people like, you know, I just did not know were Masons. But th these folks uh, stuck out to me uh, very much so. This is the family of Joseph and uh, Jane McBride. This photo was taken uh, circa 1895. Um, there's Joseph McBride uh, with his wife, uh, Nancy Jane Curry McBride, uh, and all of their children. Uh, Joe McBride was born uh, the second son of Henry uh, and Mary McBride, they were born, he was a slave of a man named Andrew McBride uh, in a place called Troy, Alabama. Um, uh, in researching Joe McBride's life and his family and his history, it was, it was very typical of men uh, and masons who, from his time period. And with, again, we're talking about the last generation of people born into slavery in the United States. Uh, Joe McBride would go on to actually uh, have somewhat of a middle class uh, lifestyle. He was a landowner, a uh, very well respected citizen. Uh, in the community, and as we can see here from this uh, uh, picture right there, it's a little distorted, I apologize about that. Uh, he actually became the treasurer of Myrtle Lodge number 162 in Spring Hill, Alabama, which is an, un an unincorporated uh, African American community right outside the city of Troy. Um, also, we, are, we actually see here, uh, if you look up uh, right there, it says Toby Townsend, uh, with JW, that stands for Junior Warden, uh, which Junior Warden is kind of like a second vice president position. And uh, I'm going to slide back for just one second. If you see his daughter right there with the uh, slash mark across her face, Toby Townsend actually was her husband, as I was later find out. Um, there's just one thing about Joseph McBride. That, uh, one last detail I need to tell you all. He's my great, 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 great grandfather. Four greats. He was a Prince Hall Mason. Uh, born a slave, became a Prince Hall Mason. And um, I actually got that picture from my grandfather. Both those pictures actually I got from my grandfather. We got it from his grandmother. Um, I had no idea that he was a Prince Hall Mason until that day, and uh, I don't know where Ken went, but he can tell you, when, oh, there, he is, there he is, he can tell you, when I found that, I was in tears, because I, I was not looking for that. Actually, I was looking for another relative, and I found him, and I was, you know, I, I was in tears. So, uh, with that said, I'm actually dedicating this presentation to the memory of Brother Joseph McBride. Uh, thank you. Okay, so, let's begin. Uh, again, the topic of that I'm talking about today is <coughs> agitation and abolition. But one thing I want to get into first is the, the psychology of what what would make somebody like my, my ancestor Joe McBride and so many others uh, decide to even want to become Masons, especially so fresh out of slavery. What was it that really would lead them into this direction? So um, I'm starting off this presentation with kind of a funny uh, funny sounding slide. Uh, Masonic aprons save houses, and I know everyone's going, "What is? What, what are you talking about?" Um, Right here, photo, this photo is of uh, Mr. Allison Kreiner. Uh, he's not a relative. He is not a relative of mine, but uh, he was a slave uh, in Newmarket, Alabama, which is, I believe, on the western side of the state, closer to the Mississippi border. And in as the Civil War was going on, he was a child. But as an older man in 1921, he actually was contacted by the descendant, uh, the granddaughter of his former slave master, uh, Mr. Isaac Kreiner. And she asked him. She's a college student. She says. Uh, you know, Mr. you know, I know slavery was a very raw time, and I know it's very emotional. But I'm really trying to learn about what was your life like being a slave in my family. Were they good slave owners? Were they bad slave owners? Like, there's a difference, okay? Um, and Allison Prater says, okay, if you want to know what it was like? I'll tell you. And he writes a very, very long letter detailing what his childhood was like as a slave of her grandpa. And his account of the uh, Civil War is very interesting. And I'm gonna, I'm just gonna read to you a very short. A snippet from what he says to kind of give you an idea of what, how, how masonry plays into this uh, discussion. Uh, Mr. Carter says, and I quote, uh, this letter is dated uh, January 22nd, excuse me, January 22nd, 1921. He says, quote, the Civil War broke out and the Yankees came to our house. This was the Black Dutch. The Bushwhackers had waylaid the road and killed General McCook on August 2nd, 1862. 
at night on his way to Nashville. They burned all the fine dwellings in the neighborhood at Newmarket and did not allow the white ladies to take as much as a photo or a dress from the burning building. They did not burn up my old master's house, however, because Miss Betty had showed them some Masonic apparatus. But they took the silverware from my mother who had hid it. Now again, this is something that when, it kind of stuck out to me when I read when I first read this uh, document um, because I actually got I actually was informed about this from a, a friend of mine and I'm a, I'm really into family history and uh, a friend of mine showed this to me and said wow that's interesting that he would know that his master was a mason and you know, why would that be uh, this apron is not that is not the same uh, apparatus that he's talking about but it's it's from another situation which was exactly the same and as I started to research this I said wow you know there's a lot of stories from slaves talking about their masters being masons in the Civil War and all these miraculous things happening because somebody showed them an apron or a ring or what have you. And that, that started to play into my thinking. I said, wow, you know, after 1865, after the Emancipation uh, <coughs> Proclamation, uh, you start having all these Prince Hall Grand Lodges popping up between 1866 and 1875. They start, they, you know, the, the fraternity explodes, membership explodes exponentially. So this was something that I wanted to look at. Uh, again, I want to, I just want to look at you know, who are these Prince Hall Masons. Uh, this is actually uh, a lithograph, uh, a copy of which is actually here at the exhibit. By the way, please support the African American Civil War Museum. They've been a great partner to us in putting this program together. And uh, let's give them a round of hand. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this lithograph, um, I actually first saw this out uh, here, as a matter of fact. It's actually over there in the back corner by the restroom, so please uh, check it out on your way out. Uh, but if you look uh, right here on the uh, uh, the left hand side there, you'll see all these different images that uh, are related to the, the uh, emancipation of black people and all the different factors that played into it. So we see uh, the Holy Bible, you know, starting to say that slavery was unjust, it was against God's law. Well, uh, at the very tip of the top uh, in the center, you'll, see, you'll actually see three names. You'll see the name of uh, Martin Delaney, who um, our previous presenter uh, highlighted very eloquently. Uh, then you'll see Frederick Douglass, who actually was not a Mason, and actually was, he actually thought that black men had, in his words, better things to do than play dress up. And that actually played a part in him and Mark Delaney kind of having a fall up because Delaney uh, was, was a very, very active Mason. Not only was he writing on, on the topic uh, of, the, of the organization, but he also was an administrative officer. He actually served as a deputy grand master uh, for the Southern Western District uh, up in Ohio. Uh, and then last but not least, we actually see uh, Hiram Revels the first black man to serve in the United States Senate, who also was a very active Mason and happened to be the Grand Chaplain of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge in the state of Ohio. Yeah, and there's actually several lodges uh, named after Hiram Rebels uh, during the early Reconstruction period. So we see here that, that Masonry is playing a very subtle, hidden role, but then also, I mean, there's a blatant role right there. If you look right here on this uh, slide, you'll see three men dressed in fraternal garb of that day. And I see several Masons and Eastern Stars here in the audience, so anybody can recognize. We see top hats, we see sashes, we see aprons, we see, we see pennants. These are things that the fraternity still uses down to this very day. And I thought that was very interesting because I said, wow, you know, even in the civil rights movement and down to today, you really don't see that, uh, uh, you don't see Prince Hall Masons as visual as you did back then. But it got me thinking, well, why, what were they doing? Why, what, what, what did they do that was so important that would get them on a lithograph like this, uh, celebrating the 15th Amendment? Uh, well, to start at the beginning, uh, very briefly for those who do not know, Prince Hall uh, was a free African American living in Boston during the American Revolution. Uh, he was uh, most likely born as a slave to William Hall, and uh, documents show that he was probably manumitted in, in, in uh, April 9, 1770. Uh, on March 6, 1775, Prince Hall uh, became a master mason in an Irish uh, military lodge, Irish Constitution Lodge 441, uh, with 14 other black men. Um, on September 24, 1784, he was actually granted a uh, charter from the Grand Lodge of England, which is the founding um, Masonic organization of the entire world. And uh, he started African Lodge number 459 and served as master from that date until his death. Um, after his death, the movement uh, became uh, nationwide over the next few decades, and now we've taken on the name of Prince Hall Affiliated Grand Lodges in, in his honor. Uh, but Prince Hall was a very, very, very active uh, civil rights advocate early on in the birth of the New Republic. Uh, Prince Hall was uh, a very active in, in the fields of education, but also in terms of, uh, of petitioning the Massachusetts legislature to actually abolish the slave trade and help to educate uh, black children. There's actually a document showing that he actually was a uh, proponent of black schools. He opened his house to educate black children and get young Harvard University professors 
to actually come in their off time to try to teach uh, our children, which again, who's doing this in the 1770s, 1780s? Um, Prince Hall actually petitioned for the assistant for uh, for assistance to free uh, uh, kidnapped African men and women to try to get them home. If anybody's seen the film Twelve Years a Slave, let me tell you right now that story might have been a little different had Solomon Northrup uh, been involved with the Masonic fraternity. Uh, I'm going to read to you something very quickly because I know time is of the essence. Uh, this letter is from. Uh, Reverend Jeremy Belknap, who was a very good friend of Prince Hall, uh, he writes, quote, he, writes, he wrote this on uh, April 18, 1788, to Benjamin Rush of Philadelphia. He said, I have one good piece of news to tell you. The Negroes who were kidnapped from here last winter have returned. They were carried to St. Bartholomew's and offered for sale. One of them was a sensible fellow and a Freemason. The merchant to whom they were offered was of this fraternity. They soon became acquainted. The Negro told his story. They, were carried before the governor with the shipmaster and the super court. The story of the Negroes was that they were decoyed on board under pretense of working. The story was the story of the other, being the ship captain, was that they were purchased out of jail where they were confined for a robbery. The governor detained them. They were kept with him for, uh, within the limits uh, until a, a gentleman from the island, being a bondsman, uh, for them for six months, in which time they sent for proof after which arrived, they were liberated. The morning after their arrival here, they made me a quick visit, being introduced by Prince Hall, who is primus inter impresario of the blacks in this town of Boston. So this shows you, again, Prince Hall is not an elected official, but he is uh, uh, at the head of the governing structure of the African community, the virgin African American community of, of Revolutionary War Boston. Uh, we see here, Again, this, this bursts a philosophy of liberation with Prince Hall really at the head of whether people knew it or not. Uh, another famous uh, member of African Lodge early on was David Walker. David Walker, uh, the, the very, very, very uh, epitome of what this spirit embodied at the time, uh, would actually serve as African Lodge 459 secretary. Uh, probably his most famous work being that of uh, David Walker's Appeal, uh, where he actually was advocating for blacks to liberate themselves by any means necessary hundreds of years before Malcolm X would ever utter those words. Uh, Walker uh, would also work as a sales agent for Freedom's Journal, uh, the first black-owned newspaper in America, and his son, Edward G. Walker, became the first black man elected to the Massachusetts legislature. Uh, earlier, uh, Brother Tahuti Evans mentioned uh, William Custis Costin, uh, one of the founding members of Social Lives Number One, uh, the first secretary, third worshipful master. Uh, that's his picture right there. Uh, something I don't think that our brother pointed out was that William Custis Costin, in his day job, he actually worked uh, here in the District of Columbia as a clerk for the Bank of Washington. And upon his death, uh, the Bank of Washington actually uh, authorized the sketch to be drawn of him, and it's uh, still in existence here today. I believe the Library of Congress actually has the original um, of it. Uh, and again, we start to see that this model, this template, as, as our brother pointed out earlier, uh, is something that spreads not only from Boston but to, to Philadelphia and then to New York, and then to Rhode Island, and then to New Jersey, and then here in 1848 in Washington, D.C. It spreads uh, dramatically because it's successful and it's actually working. And one thing that we saw earlier with Mr. Kreiner's uh, letter is that masonry was something that actually could cross the color lines so that business could be handled, and whenever there was uh, any kind of racial tension, a kidnapping, anything of that nature, there was some kind of a common level where black men and white men could discuss the matters of the day. Conflict erupts. Uh, in 1861, the uh, Civil War breaks out on April the 12th and uh, lasts until the Confederates who surrender on April the 9th, 1865. Prince Hall Masons, all of whom fell into categories of being runaway slaves, free men, uh, you know, the sons of runaways, uh, they all felt a united bond in trying to end this specter that had lasted over their lives as long as they could remember. Uh, according to a Masonic census that had actually been taken uh, of white Freemasons in the year 1858, Roughly 4%, 4% of all military-aged white men in America were members of the Masonic fraternity. So what I tried, what I decided to do for this presentation is I actually took that number, 4%, and applied it to black America. Uh, the, the, the history shows us, documents show us that uh, when the United States Colored Troops were actually drawn up for enlistment, uh, they numbered some 178,895 black men fighting for the freedom of their people. 4% of that number would, be, would mean that there were 
approximately 7,155 Prince Hall Masons serving in the Union Army for, during the Civil War. Now, that's a huge number. And outside of probably a religious affiliation, I can't think of any other organization that would have had that kind of a grasp on black men at this time. I, I, just, I just can't. Uh, so, so this shows us again, this is a very, this is a uniting effort, but, but it goes even a little deeper than that. Uh, Prince Hall Military Lodges, which is something that anybody who's in the Masonic Fraternity, uh, Eastern Stars today, we're very familiar with. Um, a lot of our, a good portion of our membership today actually um, either joined or are members of military uh, lodges. We have one here in the District of Columbia, as a matter of fact, uh, Nathaniel Adams Lodge number 28. Uh, but the first Prince Hall Military Lodge actually is started during the Civil War. Uh, that lodge was Lewis Hayden Lodge number 8, named after Grand Master Lewis Hayden, who at this time was the Grand Master of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Massachusetts. He was also one of the uh, uh, people to actually think up of, you know, to, to the governor saying, hey, why don't we start enlisting black men? And when they come, they're coming already trained, they're coming disciplined. And, and uh, in uh, a few, the next slide, you'll see that there's actually documents showing that when the white officers would walk up to a captain or a major, any of these so-called lower level officers and try to tell them something, the lower level officer would get more respect than the white officer sometimes. But that's because the, the captain or the major or what have you was somebody important within the Masonic fraternity, but the white officers were totally oblivious to this at this time. Uh, here we see Brother Peter uh, Vogelsang. Uh, he actually, I believe he became a first lieutenant uh, with the Massachusetts 54th, which was what the regiment that this lodge was attached to. And for those who do not know, the Massachusetts 54th is the same regiment that, uh, if you saw Blue Glory, it's the, it's the same, these are the same people, but they had their own agenda. They had their own organization, which is actually documented in the history of, that, of the 54th, which was written by Captain Emilio, uh, who wrote that First Sergeant William Gray of Company C had received a Masonic charter and organized a lodge on Morris Island, which is in, uh, in South Carolina. And again, that lodge was named after Grand Master Lewis Hayden. Uh, Brothers on the front line. Uh, these are just two examples of Prince Hall Masons who not only were talking the talk, but were walking the walk. Uh, again, we meet our friend Major Martin R. Delaney, uh, Deputy Grand Master for, uh, in the state of Ohio, uh, a brilliant, brilliant Prince Hall Mason scholar. And then we also see a, another uh, uh, Prince Hall Mason who was, in many ways, uh, uh, in the same model as Martin Delaney out in the Midwest, uh, Captain William D. Matthews, who, again, both of these men were very active in, uh, in recruiting black men to serve in the United States. Uh, uh, colored troops, uh, they both were, at, not only were they active in that activity, but they were also not just members of the Masonic fraternity, these men are grand masters, these men are, are high-ranking officials in the organization, so when they're telling brothers, form up, when they're telling brothers, let's do this, let's do that, da da they're doing it with an extra added dose of moral authority over their fellow servicemen. Uh, after the Civil War ends, uh, thankfully, I hope you all know that, the, you know, the North won, uh, we, start to see, we start to see the birth of black uh, elected officials, uh, one of the first being the of Hiram Rebels. Again, where are you going to find your black elected officials in the 1860s, 1870s, and 1880s? They're, where are they going to get their training? There were, there were very few of them had college degrees. There, were no form, there was no formal system. They're coming out of primarily the church, but also the Prince Hall Masonic Lodges. And anybody involved in Masonic fraternity, or any, really any fraternal organization, can understand why, where those skills uh, would come from. Uh, I see a couple of my Masonic College graduates in here. <laughs> um, Senator Rebels, again, grand chaplain uh, and a brilliant, brilliant um, Masonic scholar and politician. Um, now, here's something that, uh, uh, a special thing that I found, and I'm actually uh, winding down. Um, a lot of people know the person uh, furthest away from me, which is Senator Blanche K. Bruce. He was the uh, uh, first full-term African-American senator to uh, come in after Hiram Rebels. But a lot of people don't know this man right here, uh, Grand Master Henry C. Bruce. That's his older brother. Senator Blanche K. Bruce's older brother was a Grand Master of the Prince Hall. He was the third Grand Master of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge uh, of Kansas, serving that in 1879. A lot of us, again, we've heard of the, the book and the movie now, uh, 12 Years a Slave. Well, this is Henry C. Bruce's autobiography, 29 Years a Slave, 29 Years a Free Man, by Grandmaster Henry C. Bruce. Um, and again, the Masonic, uh, and, I, and again, I'm in contact with actually with their family members uh, and, and have discussed some of this stuff with them and some of the items that they have. Um, and they were, they were totally oblivious almost because Grandmaster Bruce doesn't write any of this stuff down. That he was a Mason, Grandmaster, he doesn't write any of this in his autobiography. But, when, in researching the family, we found that not only was he a Mason, 
but so was Blanche Bruce. They had another brother, J.J. Uh, Bruce, who was grand treasurer in Missouri, another brother who was grand this, grand that. The whole, all the siblings, all the male siblings, were high-ranking Prince Hall Masons and active civil servants. And last but not least, I'm finishing uh, with John T. Costin, who again was pointed out earlier, uh, he was actually the son of uh, Brother William C. Costin, uh, making him a great-grandson of uh, Martha, First Lady Martha Custis Washington. Uh, he served on the committee we heard about earlier uh, that went to see President Lincoln. Uh, but he also worked with the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, he helped rewrite the Georgia State Constitution after he served uh, in that capacity uh, Grand Master here in the District of Columbia. He, he traveled south for a few years. But he wrote, he would write back to the jurisdiction. And in a few weeks, we're actually having our uh, annual session where we receive correspondence and letters and official acts. And Grand Master Costin, he wrote something uh, very interesting that I'm going to uh, leave you all with. <coughs> um, and to show them the kind of integrity that these men had, but also the hidden hand that they had under the table, which was this. Grandmaster Costin would write in his report for Making Georgia on July 25, 1867, to the Freedmen's Bureau, where he write, The Rebs cursed me terribly, some threatening to shoot me, but the only thing that occurred was I was spit upon by a rebel while passing him in the street. I took no notice of the insult, however, because there were nearly 2,000 colored persons in the place, and nearly every one of them had firearms. <laughs> now, I, I see some, some Grand Lodge officers in here today. I don't know if, if, if y'all want to go back to that rule or not, but I'm a firm believer, even though he doesn't put it in here, I'm a firm believer that when Grand Master Costin arrived to South Carolina, arrived to Georgia, and he's meeting these, uh, these fresh uh, uh, black soldiers, after, and this is immediately after the Civil War is over, okay? Uh, I'm a firm believer that those brothers down there knew, some of them knew that that was a grand master and nothing better happened. So with that, thank you for your time. Uh, I greatly appreciate it.